That's one, two, or no? Okay. Okay, so I am calling the select board meeting um, to order on August 29th at 7.03 p.m. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got a very focused, short agenda tonight, a very important agenda. Um, so before we get started with the interview of our two candidates for police chief, I want to explain to the public what the process is that has gotten us to the point we are at tonight as far as selecting a new police chief. But first, I wanted to thank our town administrator, Mr. Perkle, and our assistant town administrator, Ms. Hale, for their assistance in this process. They have both ably guided select board to get to the point we are at tonight. Their experience in this process has been immensely helpful to all of us. The select board decided unanimously to initially engage in an internal search process to select a new chief. If that process did not result in a new chief being appointed, then the search would be expanded to external candidates. In the past, the process to select new public safety chiefs have been both internal and external. There are reasons for both, and we felt in this case that the internal search was warranted. Two current Southport policemen applied for the chief's position. Lieutenant Ryan Newell, who has been acting chief for the past six months, and Sergeant Sean McCarthy. Each has worked in the Southport Police Department for many years. The select board sincerely thanks both candidates for engaging this process with us. It is not easy to apply for a job in the public sector. We hired Community Paradigm to assess all candidates at a cost of $6,000. We also sought input from two local residents who have public safety backgrounds. One is a retired Westboro policeman, Pete Goodney, and one is a current Walton firefighter, Brendan Berry. The assessment center panel consisted of three people, all retirees of relevant public service positions. There were two retired police chiefs and a retired town manager on the panel, and two men, one woman. The assessment, excuse me, the assessment process included a written exercise, an oral exercise, and a role play. The select board observed the oral exercise and the role play. Upon completion, the assessors prepared a written report for the site board that included their evaluation of each candidate. Tonight is the last step in the internal process. We will interview each candidate separately. Mr. Purple and Ms. Hill have helped the select board prepare a set of 15 questions that will be asked each candidate. Each select board member will ask three questions. After the second interview, the select board will decide whether to vote on the appointment of either candidate as the next chief or sleep on it and come back tomorrow night. If anyone wants to wait until tomorrow night, that is what we will do. When and if we appoint a new chief, we will enter into executive session to start the process of negotiating the new chief's contract. We will allow public comment before we vote tonight, if we decide to vote tonight. If we decide to wait until tomorrow, tomorrow night, we will allow public comment at the end of the meeting. There will be no public comment tomorrow night. Um, and also to make clear, um, you will not be able to view this meeting tonight live on YouTube like we normally do, but it will be posted later tonight yes. so that you can see it tomorrow. Um, you do have access per Zoom. All right, so with that, let's get started. You ready? Mr. Pro? Okay. Andrew, all right. Oh. <laughs> Step one. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sergeant McCarthy. Um, to get started today, um, we would like you to share with us your plan for the first 90 days if you are hired as South Burrow's next police chief. Or I'd be happy to. Um, in the first 90 days as police chief, really, you have to get used to your new role and people have to get used to you in your new role. Um, they have to understand that you have a new position and that you have to set clear and concise expectations. And in that time, you really have to do a litmus test and really speak with everyone in the department from top to bottom, from left to right, 
and really get all their input into what we want to do going forward. And that's not only just with department members internally, but it's also interdepartmental. I was talking with the fire chief, the DPW heads, school departments. And that's going to take a little bit of time. And in that time, we're also going to reach out to the community and the stakeholders and everybody else in the community so I can get their input into what we're going to do with this department. Because as a chief of police, it's not your department or my department. This is our department, and we have to do it together. So, Sergeant McCarthy, we've got 15 questions we're going to ask you. Okay. Each member is going to ask three questions. Four of us are here. Ms. Braccio is going to ask her question via Zoom. Oh, there she's answering. Sorry. Hi, Lisa. There she is. Okay. Uh, we're asking the same set of questions for both candidates. Okay. Um, so, um, here we go. So, we're going to rotate um, on the five of us for each set of questions. So, Andrew. So, um, good evening, Sar Sergeant McCarthy. Hi. Please describe two specific accomplishments in your local government law enforcement career that you consider to be the most significant. First, um, I'm very proud of the fact, there's a few I could pick from. Um, I think becoming a uh, leader in the training division was a significant um, accomplishment for me. Um, I was put in front of uh, training for the entire department. And when you take on a new position, you don't always know exactly everything that you're gonna be handling, what you're gonna be working with. And in that position, um, I took over and we had a platform, a computer platform called PMAM HMC, which is our policy and training platform. And I didn't know much about it. I wasn't a huge computer guy, um, but I took it over and I made the program our own through input through everyone in the department. And we started utilizing it better. <clears throat> and I've been doing that now for about two and a half years, and I worked so hard on the implementation of this program for accreditation and, and tracking that, believe it or not, I was asked to be on the company's um, advisory board. So now I'm working with six, seven other law enforcement executives around the nation to craft this um, program to work better for all of the agencies around the country. But what's nice about that is I can be selfish, right? I can ask to make it specifically tailored towards the town of Southbrook. So that was a big accomplishment. Um, another large accomplishment. I was going to talk about being a DRE, but I think one of my favorite accomplishments since being in a leadership position here is just leading and recruiting. And I used to have a mentor of mine, so I used to go down to the CrossFit gym here in South Rome, South Hill Road. I was a member there for about five or six years. And I had a mentor there, and he was my coach. And he was helping me to become better through physical fitness and this and that. And I, I really noticed that his core values were great. He was a great person. So we started to become friends and he really got interested in law enforcement. And so I said, hey, I can help you. Let's, let's see if you want to get into law enforcement. And he was going out looking for jobs all around the state. And I was helping him to do that. And I was like, man, he would really be a good fit for South Pro. And um, he did. He ended up coming here. He helped him. He got through uh, Officer Jeff Norton. He's a newer officer, but he's already excelling. He's already the senior citizen liaison. He's becoming a school resource officer. So I know that's not really a, a technical uh, something that I've achieved, but I, I'm very proud to work with people and people from our community and bring them into the department if that works. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa? Good evening, Sergeant McCarthy. <clears throat> Excuse Hi, me. Please explain how you would plan to keep the town administrator and the select board informed about projects, problems, and issues. Provide examples of techniques you have successfully used in the past. Thank you. Okay, well, it all comes down to communication, really. Um, informal and formal communication is important. And it has to be done with a strategic plan. And I have a strategic plan in mind and a strategic budget. And those are things that you really have to focus on because you have to just look at the short-term goals and mid-range goals and the long-term goals. And we really have to work together with that and decide what, where we want to go and how we want to do it. And we have to do it together because one person or one unit can't do it. Because I understand that while as a chief of police, you know, I have a 30,000 foot view over the police department. I can see where we have deficiencies. I can see where we're great through input and everybody else telling me this. But I also have to realize that the town administrator, the assistant town administrator and the select board, well, I have a 30,000 foot view. You guys have a 100,000 foot view. So like if I need resources and I know we have finite fiscal resources because we're a responsible town and I appreciate that as a taxpayer. Um, I know that when I'm asking for something that it has to be together and we have to come to um, an agreement so we can move forward for the same goal and same purpose. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, Sam? Good evening, Sergeant McCarthy. Yes, Welcome. Sir. Thank you. Um, the department will have a vacancy based on who was appointed chief. Describe what qualities you'd look for in command staff candidates during the uh, promotional process. And what other individuals would you ask to assist you in this process? Well, first, the assist assistance, um, I would want to have input from everybody because I think inclusion is very important because everyone's opinion really does matter. It's not it's not years ago where the top couple people in a department make decisions for the entire group. Everybody needs to be included and input needs to be taken from everyone. Um, what characteristics would I look for? Uh, somebody that's self-disciplined, somebody that can hold themselves accountable, someone that's maybe a transformational leader. They like to help others grow and mentor them to become uh, better versions of themselves. Um, I mean, we have many members of our department, almost all members of our department that fit that mold. So, so we're very lucky here at this organization. Thank you. You're welcome. Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sergeant McCarthy. Um, do you have any experience with regional dispatch for police and fire? What do you think are the challenges and or opportunities? Um, I have experience. I ran our dispatch division for three years. Um, and in that, it's kind of like its own culture within the police department. Um, it's really a whole division, right? You have people, you have training, um, you have grants. Like I wrote grants to get resources for that. Um, now with regionalized dispatch, uh, I do have friends that are obviously in the industry. A lot of my uh, childhood friends are also police officers, firefighters that have uh, regional dispatch. Um, there are goods and bads to everything. And obviously we'd have to talk about that, but the good things about regional dispatch would be staffing and training. I mean, that takes up a lot of money and a lot of time, and that would be good for regional dispatch. Another reason it's good for regional dispatch would be um, equipment items. You know, we're gonna have to replace a water tower, have to replace some stuff for our radio system because our radio system has longevity costs. Um, so those are two outstanding reasons why to look towards it. Um, some other downsides that there may be, I mean, we don't really want to have a dark dispatch. That's something that the communities can have to put their input into. Um, do you want to walk into a station and have a, a, you know, a button that you press that calls an officer in off the road? I really hate to see no one in there. So you might have to replace dispatchers with officers or civilians. So it might not be something that's so even back and forth fiscally. Um, so I'm open to it, um, but I really want to get the input from the people in this department the input from the people in the town and the dispatchers themselves because they're great employees and, and we care about them and they have to know that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm next. This is a little bit long, so hang with me here. Sure. Um, as a police chief, one of your greatest roles will be overseeing the budget of the police department. Please illustrate what analysis we will utilize to maximize the operations of the department while staying within fiscal constraints. Um, just Discuss how you would manage the overtime line item in a year that put excessive demands on the overtime line item because of community needs. Sure, um, great question. Um, well, you have to do it. You have to stay on it. You know, you can't you can't look at something every couple of months. You have to really track it almost on a, on a weekly basis. You know, you have to look at it. You have to. You know, I would definitely lean on Cindy McLeod. She's awesome. She really understands our budget. And we know that we have a certain burn rate that we have to look at when officers are taking time off, when officers are calling in or whatever it may be. Um, you know, you have to look at that on a weekly basis, look at the metrics, look at the monthly trends, see how it's going. And obviously at the end of the year, go back and say, hey, how did we get here? Where did we come from? And why is it like this? You know, hopefully we're gonna be within the fiscal um, guidelines of the, of the budget. But if there was any chance that we were gonna go outside of that, you would have to be told about that way in advance. There should be no surprises to the community or to you saying, hey, I mean, if you manage a budget, you manage it correctly, you're gonna spend that money for what you ask for because otherwise you're asking for too much. You don't need extra money if you're not gonna spend it. So you shouldn't be giving money back at the end of the year. You should really use your budget right to the line if you can. Now, our overtime budget is right around $148,000 give or take, you know, a couple of dollars here and there. And we do have some things we would have to discuss because it is extremely finite. What we did about three years ago was necessary. We went from a two officer minimum to a three officer minimum. I mean, we had to do that. Having two officers on the road just isn't safe for the community. It's not safe for the officers. But we brought it up to the staffing level of three. Now that's great, but our overtime budget really is going to those operational costs solely at this point. 
you know, to backfill. And what that did was that took away our opportunity for more training. We need more training. And the way we do that is through the overtime budget. Um, you know, I have brought in training to this room from outside from the Municipal Police Institute and brought in outstanding trainers. And we've had them here and other uh, communities come here to train. And we've had two free seats. So that's free training for us. But we didn't have the money that we could actually send officers to the training in this building to get free training because it wasn't in the overtime budget. Um, so that's just one thing that, you know, I would like to discuss a little bit more. Um, but like I said, it's constant communication and you have to have, you know, transparency, not only within the department and with the public, but with the leaders in this town. It's not fair for you to, to have somebody that identifies a key issue and doesn't bring it to you because you have to know because that's how you mitigate risk. Um, you know, I've worked here for 18 years now and, you know, I'll hear an officer say like, this thing's been broken for forever. Does anyone care about this? It's like, well, it's, have you told anyone about it? Well, no, I haven't, Sergeant. Okay, I'll take care of it. So you really have to let the leadership know what needs to be fixed, and you can't shy away from that. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, Andrew. What are the critical elements of training officers to handle calls when they are faced with a mental health emergency, and how would you utilize mental health professionals on these calls? Um, iPad training is really important. It's integral communication training, and it has to do with mental health calls. And, you know, it's, I always like to say it's officer, it's officer safety first, and you have to go into it thinking that way. However, when you go into one of those situations, you really have to understand that a person is in a, a mental crisis. It's not, it's not a criminal situation. So we're there just to help. And you have to use tactics and negotiation skills so that you can try to help that person and get them to the hospital and the help they need. Now, we do have a JDP program, which has been outstanding for us, and they are trained at a much higher level than we are to deal with mental health. You know, we go in, we make sure the scene's secure, and we let Carly uh, come in and do her thing, and it's been great. Um, but more training is needed, and like I said, to get that ICAT training or to get that mental health training, we would need to talk about increasing the overtime budget. I know it's not popular for someone sitting in this chair to say, but it's a, it's a necessary thing that needs to be done. Thank you. Lisa. Thank you. Um, recruiting and retaining police officers is a major challenge for today's police leaders. What are the effective recruiting methods for police departments and what strategies could contribute to improved employee retention? It really comes down to identifying our main core values and who we employ um, and make sure that they're in alignment with our organizational goals, not only so our, indiv our individual goals, match our organizational goals. And when you have that, you can build relationships. And in those relationships, you can build bar partnerships. And when you do that, you create an inspired workforce. And if you can do that, there's synergy. And you have to make sure that the people you're hiring are the people that need to represent the town, represent the department, and everyone in this, in this area. Um, there's a lot of things we can do um, for recruiting. I mean, just like I talked about Officer Norton, every day we have opportunities to recruit ourselves. You know, we go out in the community and you make contact with a citizen. It's going to be positive, negative, or neutral. And hopefully it's always going to be positive. But you don't have to look for somebody that um, you can find them in the strangest places, maybe at a gym, or maybe you go into a Starbucks and you see someone behind the counter. It's like, hey, you ever thought about being a police officer? We're our own best recruitment. I really do believe that. And we have to have um, places to look and what better place than right here in our own community to represent our community. Um, there's other things that we can do through social media. And, um, you know, I talked to a mentor and a friend of mine, and he is actually, he was the Dean of Multicultural Affairs over at Framingham State. He was just actually made into the HR director for Framingham State. So I talked to him, I said, if we need to recruit some people here, could we get into your pipeline of criminal justice students at Framingham State so that, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can say, hey, we have hiring opportunities and we would love to have that. I mean, they're right next door. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things we can do. We can always work harder and we can communicate more. But yeah, I have a lot of ideas for that. And it's, I think that recruitment and retention and career development of employees are the number one thing a police leader can do for any community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is a two part question. You actually have had a head start on this from oh, your earlier answers. Sorry about that. <laughs> you have to do more than that one. Uh, first, please provide some examples of how you have mentored or taught others and what was the outcome of your efforts. 
Second, um, what training or development do you think is important to develop a succession plan as officers transition to the department? Um, let's see, Trilla. First part of your question had to do with mentoring. Mentoring? Yes. Well, mentoring is a great thing, and it's something that I, I, I love to do. Um, Mentoring works in a, in a bunch of different ways. You know, when you come into the department, it's not always top-down mentoring from the top to the bottom, but you have to be willing to do reverse mentoring. Um, and everybody has to work towards that common goal. And when you get to put your time and effort into growing people, it's very fulfilling. And, you know, you have to also think, you know, we have so many different generations working here. I think we probably have four generations working in our police department now. We have our boomers, we have our ex-gens. We have our millennials and we have our uh, iGens or Zoomers, I guess you call it. And it's not hard to say, listen, I may be generation X, but I know that this millennial or this iGen knows so much more about social media than I do. So, hey, could you teach me that? So you can't have an ego when you mentor. It, it goes both directions. Um, I think that was a great question. The second part had to do with succession plan. What do you, what do you need for training to have a succession Oh, okay. Plan? Well, leadership training is, is huge because every member of our police department is a leader in their own right. They're, you know, regardless of rank or title, every person that works here is a leader for our community. So you need to have leadership training and leadership training is so important. It's, a, it's something that I've practiced and I've looked at and I've studied. And the thing about being a leader is, especially a chief of police or a lieutenant or a sergeant, nobody owns that leadership position. It's merely rented. And the rent that you pay is the development and growth of leaders to replace you when you're ready to leave. Thank you. You're welcome. Chelsea. Police community relations are particularly strained right now across our country. In your current role in the department, what steps have you taken to address issues of race and equity? As chief, what actions would you take to address these issues in our community? Well, I think we would have already identified that situation through our common core values and development of our why because any type of um, bias is not welcome here it's not something that we tolerate um, we would have to really look at inclusion and a lot more training and like i know i keep stressing training and i know i'm in charge of training but training is so important i mean unconscious bias and the implicit bias it's a real thing you know we're human beings everybody has a bias you know and the important thing is that you can identify those biases um, I just read a great book uh, last year called A Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias. I'd say take a look at it if you could. And it really talked about a lot of that and why, um, you know, your brain processes 11 million units of information. I don't go too deep into it, but cognitively you can only do 40. So in your neural pathways, it's making shortcuts. And you have to be able to figure out and identify issues that you have so that you can make sure that you can obtain to procedural justice because everyone deserves, deserves to be treated the same way. And everyone deserves to have transparency. And that is something that if I'm leading this department, I will continue with and continue to mentor because as you grow and as you learn, it only helps if you share that with other people. Thank you. You're welcome. The mental and physical health of every employee within the department is critically important. In your current police role, what steps have you taken to address employee wellness? First question. Second one is, as chief, what actions would you take to support the mental and physical health of South Florida Police Department employees? Great question. Um, I am a huge proponent of physical health and mental health, spiritual health, just well-being in general. I love well-being. Um, and what have I done here? Um, you know, I helped design this beautiful gym that we have. Um, that's great. And in doing that, um, we've implemented a workout program. And that workout program, you know, I've went and I've actually hired individuals to program for us so that we can train, you know, we can train for 45 minutes or so on shift and really get anything out we need to, because I think that physical health really coincides with the mental health. And if you give time to the people that are in this organization, that's going to make them better whole rounded people. And that's going to make them go out on the street and they're going to treat people like they should be treated. Because if you can lead yourself and you can be um, mentally aware and self-aware, and you can really look into these things. And, you know, I'd probably be embarrassed to say this about 10 years ago, but I really started getting into like mindfulness and yoga and, um, meditation. And it's just very important. It, it's, it's something that 
I strive to do in our department in my current role. And it's something that I will keep doing forever because I think that health and wellness is so important because you have to keep people stable. And, you know, I would even go as far as working with the union and trying to figure out during contract negotiations, can we figure out maybe we can give the officers a day off? And in that day off, could you please at least go get a physical? Because you have to get physicals, you know, and it helps to identify things before it happens. Or if you want to go talk to a mental health counselor, there can't be any stigma when it comes to mental health. It's just, it, it's not a good look and it's not what we're driving to do here. So, I mean, financial planning, there's so much we could do for our officers and stuff here that would help them be better citizens, help them be better officers. It's something that I'm hyper-focused on and something that I would not let lapse going forward. Andrew. Thank you. It is often said you shouldn't take a job that does not scare you in some way, shape, or form. So uh, three questions. Three okay. Three questions. <laughs> what scares you about taking this job? Conversely, what are you most looking forward to? Where do you think your greatest learning curve was? Okay, so the first question so first is, is what scares, what scares you? me about taking what scares the job? You? What are you most looking forward to? And where do you think your greatest learning curve lies? All right, I'm gonna start with the first one. I might have to ask you a follow-up to get the okay, second one. Sure. Uh, what scares me the most about taking this job um, it's a good question. I think that the thing that concerns me the most about taking this job is that I would have to be the exception to the rule when it came to nationwide police chiefs generally last three to five years. I mean, that's, that's their shelf life generally. And, you know, I would have to be the exception to that rule because I don't want to move on to somewhere else. I don't want to, I want to be in, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from South Bro. I live here. I love this town. I never, I've never wanted to work at any other police department and say I became chief of police in like three to five years. And hey, chief, you did a great job, but you know, you're gonna have to move on and go to a bigger agency or whatever. I would have a very hard time with that. So I would be uh, fearful that I couldn't stay in South Bro for my entire life, for my entire career, because this is where I want to be. And what was the second part of that question? What are you most looking forward to? Challenge. I love challenge. I love living outside of my comfort zone. Um, it's just where I like to be. Um, you know, whether it's doing physical fitness or mental health training or, you know, intellectual training, I'm a huge proponent of education. You know, I got my master's degree from UMass Lowell. And while I did that, I also decided I wanted to get a uh, graduate certificate in leadership and policy development, which really helped me with strategic planning and, and that type of stuff. And actually, I actually was accepted into a doctoral program for criminal justice a few months back. And I was going to start uh, this week, actually, but I deferred my enrollment because this opportunity came, came to be. So um, that's my second part to that question. I mean, what was the third? And the third is, where do you think your greatest learning curve lies? <sighs> greatest learning curve. That's a great question. I mean, I think you don't know what you don't know. You know, I, th I think that sounds kind of strange. But anytime you take a new position, there are obstacles that you face and things that you may not be able to plan for. I mean, you can strategic plan all day long and you can have things set up, but you have to be fluid too because those strategic plans can change at the blink of an eye because you don't know what's happening and going on. So I guess I don't know what I don't know. For a short answer. Lisa. Thank you. What types of programs and relationships would you build with our schools and other community sectors, such as the seniors? I think we have a good program going, but we do need to have more. I would love to have as much more involvement with the schools. Um, currently, we have a part-time school resource officer. I think we need dedicated school resource officers. I think that's just huge for not only for our children to get in contact with police officers and be involved, but I think that it's something that we really need to look into. And that would have to be something in our strategic plan going forward that we all could agree on. Um, for our seniors, I mean, we really can do a lot. You know, we do a lot right now where we go to the senior center talk, but we can do it more. And our department can do a lot more um, open door, you know, drop in with the chief, drop in with the lieutenant, drop in, let's talk, let's, let's see what's going on out there and see what can we do for you. So I can't answer you exactly what I would wanna do for the seniors without talking to the seniors. And I couldn't tell you exactly what I wanna do for the school system without taking input from the school system because it's really a holistic view that we have to use to go forward. So while I have ideas, they're not full circle yet until I speak to everybody involved. And I'm not trying to skirt the question or anything like that, but I think that that input from everybody and that inclusion is so important that I don't wanna give you an answer 
that is not something that the school department's on board with or not something that the seniors want because I don't want to waste resources somewhere if it's not needed or not wanted. So I really want to pull those individuals and say, what can we do for you? I mean, we work for them. That's that's what we do. Thank you. You're welcome. Same. Here's what I hope is a very hypothetical question. Okay. Assume that the uh, select board uh, instructs you to implement a new policy and you don't agree with it. And you think it's a bad idea. What do you do? Great question. <laughs> okay, so if that did happen, I think we'd have to work on our communication um, and talk about it. And now, I mean, I have a ton of follow-up questions I would like to ask you, but I won't put you through that. Um, if it came down to it, you know, um, I understand authority. You know, I am a police officer. Uh, I'm a voting citizen. I understand that. So in the leadership role, um, you don't always like what you have to do, but if, now, what was what was the issue with the policy? Is it just that we didn't like it, or you think it's a bad idea? Oh, it's a bad idea for whatever reason. Okay, well, I would have to make sure it was a bad idea after speaking with everyone about it. If it was surely a bad idea, if it had something to do with officer safety or something that could hurt this town, we would talk about it at length, you know, and from every angle we could to make sure we were doing what was right for the citizens. But if it was something that maybe I just didn't like you know because maybe it was something personal that i didn't like well that's 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 for me to put forward if that's what the leadership of this town wants going forward we have to stay aligned because that's the message we have to send to the community and to the people within our agency so as long as it was nothing that was going to damage our community or damage or hurt our officers um i would implement what you want um but we would talk quite a bit about it if that's okay thank you you're welcome Elkhorn Police Department will soon be implementing body cameras. What policies and procedures surrounding body cameras would be important to you as chief regarding this rollout? I welcome body cameras very much so, and I think our union does too, which is great. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we have to think about uh, prior to implementing body cameras. There's a lot of things that, um, you know, I've already gathered a lot of policies on it and reviewed it because of uh, being involved with accreditation and such. But there's stuff that we have to not only educate our officers on, but educate the community on. I mean, there's some places that are saying, you know, the sanctity of people's homes. We don't, we can't walk in with a body camera on. You have to turn it off. There's all types of stuff with training and education that you have to do. And not only the implementation of body cameras that I have to look into, we have to look into the logistical resources it's going to take to run that. I mean, my friends over in Westboro who just implemented it, it's a whole new world. They need a whole new staffing division because not only do you take your input, you have to get it ready for court. You have to store it. You have to make sure somebody's on it. It's almost a full-time job managing that asset to make sure that it's ready to go to court. So um, I would have to make sure that things were in place because like I said, I would want to stay responsibly fiscal to our budget. And I would hate to say, yeah, let's bring this program in and then get blindsided and say, hey, I didn't realize that this might cost us an extra $30,000 in overtime. It's something that we really need to discuss and digest together um, in a multifaceted way. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So hang in with me again. I've got another one. Okay. There's only one question, sir. Okay. All right. So an effective chief needs to deal fairly, objectively, and consistently with members of the department and with the public. Any internal candidate brings a history of personal relationships with department colleagues and with the public to the position of chief. How will you ensure that these relationships will not get in the way of your ability to work fairly, objectively, and consistently? with the individuals and issues you will need to deal with as chief? Okay, another good question. Um, I'm not foreign to being promoted. Um, you know, every time you take a new role, you have to identify new clear boundaries. And, um, you know, I've had the opportunity that I was a part-time dispatcher and I made it to part-time police officer, made it to police officer, detective, sergeant, and then all the different roles I had with FTO, drug recognition expert, and every single one of these roles, you really have to set your expectations and hold yourself accountable. And I don't think that, that would be an issue for the people that have developed great uh, relationships with and mentorships within the department. And I don't think it would be an issue for me in the town because with the citizens of this town, I am a citizen of this town, and I've been dealing with that for the last 18 years as I've been a police officer here. I mean, I see people every day that I deal with internally, externally, and it's it's always pleasantries. And even if it's something that we have to do where 
you know, I may have to arrest somebody that I know in town and, and I've done it before. And then I might see them at the soccer field like three days later. And it's always just depends on how you treat people. If you treat people with respect and dignity, they're going to remember that. And, you know, I remember one of the biggest compliments that I thought I got when I was a young officer was I ended up giving somebody a $350 speeding ticket, which I like to educate more than that. But if somebody has done something three times in the same area, they're just not quite learning. So I gave that person like a $350 speeding ticket. And after I did, that person said, thank you. And I said, wow. I said, that is a compliment. If you can actually try to promote positive change through that enforcement and still say thank you, you must be treating people pretty good. So uh, let's roll with that one. Okay, um, that's 15 questions. Oh. Um, so um, if you would like to, you can take this opportunity for a closing statement. Sure. Or provide any other information that you think would be beneficial for the select board to know beyond what is in your resume. Okay. Um, well, I think that I bring a lot of unique um, perspectives to the position of chief of police. Um, you know, I'm a fourth generation South resident. My kids are fifth generation. I grew up here. I went through the school system. Um, my wife, Tina, she, um, works for Youth and Family Services. She's also a town employee. Um, I live in town, I'm a taxpayer. All these things that helped me mold my worldview of what's going on at the time. Um, I've done a lot, I've been very lucky in that I have one of my leadership tenants is you have to bloom where you're planted. And being a dispatcher, being a police officer, drug recognition expert, where I actually get to testify in court as to my opinion, not just the facts. Um, I've had a great career and I've loved every second of it. I've had my dream job since 2004 when I got hired here by Chief Weber. And no matter what role I'm in, it's always been my dream job. Um, and I guess I'll just end with a short story to sum up, I think, why I'm here. Um, when I was a kid in town, I got in a little bit of trouble. I got in a little bit of trouble and I went home to my father and I said, hey, dad, you know, I did something I think was a little bit mischievous and he said all right we're going down to 19 main street and i'm going to walk you in there and you're going to tell the officers what you did and whatever comes to you is going to come to you okay dad so he brings me down i'm a young scared kid i don't know really what's going on and i walk into that lobby and i see dispatcher joe bennett and ricky mattioli and you know guys that i work with and that are great mentors to me from that day anyway the doors behind me open up and it's detective Wittis. He's with Sergeant with us now. And he took me in and I went in and I told him everything that had happened. I mean, it wasn't a huge deal to that. And um, between him and Sergeant Weber and Chief Caleri, you know, I got a little community service. So I had to do community service for the town. And for you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, whatever it may have been, I go into 19 Main Street and I would clean cruisers and I would clean uh, the station, whatever they needed me to do. And in that time, I realized I wanted to be a South Road police officer. These, the people that worked here were great. And I never want to be a federal agent, a state trooper or any other local officer. I had the opportunity, but this is where I always wanted to be. And I think that was made South Road police so special to me. And this community as a whole has made me who I am. You know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all the community members that I've known, my neighbors, my friends. So now fast forward 25 years from being that scared kid to not really know what's going on in my life. Now I'm interviewing for the chief of police position at that police department. That's not a testament to me. That's a testament to the men and women who came before me that I work with now. And I'll be working with hopefully in the future and just uh, the members of this community. So thank you. Thank you, Sergeant McCarthy yep. um, for doing this. Yeah, thank you, my pleasure. Does anyone need a break? Because we, we reserve the next 15 minutes to um, take a break. There's nothing else on the agenda, so we take a break. Our thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we said eight o'clock, so uh, you guys tuning in just yeah, for. So we, we 
we probably should stick with our schedule because that's what we chose to. Right? So we've got a little bit of a break here. Okay. So are you suggesting to take a recess or? A... Yeah. Okay. Well, there's nothing else on the agenda to discuss. That's correct. Right. Okay. So I don't have a whole lot else. So does, does Mark just go to get the? Yeah, no. so okay. we agree we're going to start at eight, like we said. We're going to okay, go. okay, so we can take a break. All right, so Thank in you. the four possible four rounds, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Are we ready? So welcome back to Chief Pool. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is ask you 15 questions. We're going to give you a chance to give us an opening statement and then a closing statement. We are rotating the questions among the five of us one at a time. So each person is going to ask you three questions. Okay, great. Okay. So you want to start off with a uh, brief opening statement and um, Share with us your plan for the first 90 days if you are hired as South Burles new police chief. Okay, uh, opening statement. Thank you all very much for having me here tonight. It's great to see you all. Um, I really appreciate uh, being in this process and it's such an honor and uh, it's really appreciate being here. Um, I've been with the South Burles Police Department for over 20 years now. Uh, it's a, a great department, a great town. I feel like I am part of this town, even though I don't live in town. Um, my whole work environment has been this town and I've grown with this department and I can't wait to continue growing in uh, this new role as the, uh, as the chief. Um, the first 90 days, um, seeing as uh, I've been in the position since February and I, I've done a lot already. Uh, I, when I came into the position, I didn't want to be a placeholder. I wanted to actively show the town uh, what I wanted to do with this position. And, uh, and immediately I began establishing relationships uh, with the town committees and community members and you know, the, the senior center, the school, we did the lunch take back. We served, went into the schools and served lunch to the kids. Um, it's just right off the bat, I wanted to let everybody know who I was and that this department was in good shape and that we have great officers that work for us. And um, so first 90 days uh, from this point on, um, I'm actively working with the schools for training for um, everything from active shooter in, in that resolve. Um, I am still working with the senior center, the senior citizen liaison officers that I established. And um, we have some great events. We did uh, get on board with them already, um, which was a, a great hit. I had about 12 of my officers came and took questions from the senior citizens. Um, I'm going to be working on a the policy for the body worn body worn cameras because uh, want to get that up and running and uh, working on a grant right now for that and so I'm going to get this grant in order hopefully get some money for that and then start to get the program in, in, and work with that um, and then right off the bat I'm going to have a, a department meeting meet with my officers you know uh, and then have individual meetings with each of the officers to go over expectations and plans for the department. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Please describe two specific accomplishments in your local government law enforcement career that you consider to be the most significant. I would say the certification and then actively and then going right into the uh, accelerated program of accreditation in 2018, I, I was able to uh, get us right into that full accreditation within one year, which was a huge accomplishment. And when the team came and did our assessment, they said that they've never had uh, a department have, have zero corrections to be made, uh, which I thought was great. And you know, at the time I got some great accolades for that. So I appreciate that. And then also uh, making lieutenant. Um, I thought I, I feel like a lieutenant is such an important role in this department. Uh, when I made that lieutenant coming off of the sergeant, being a sergeant for 15 years, and then being in the admin and the operations part of this department, uh, it was great to be involved in the decision making. So 
those two accomplishments, uh, I feel really strongly is the ones that stick out the most. Thank you. Thanks. And then Lisa is zooming in, so we're going to go to Lisa next. Hey, Lisa. Good evening. How are you, Acting Chief Noel? Thank you for being here tonight. Um, please explain how you would plan to keep the town administrator and select board informed about projects, problems, and issues. Provide examples of techniques you have successfully used in the past. Thank you. Um, sure. Uh, I would obviously keep in constant communication with the town administrator. Um, I have done that in the past. Um, whether it's we need to fill some positions within the department, I've reached out um, to the town administrator and you know, had some part-time dispatch positions open up. Um, and that way I make them aware. I also, uh, at one point I sent a group email to the select board. Um, you know, we, we had uh, a, one of our Chinese speaking officers go to a call and he was able to really assist um, a, a resident that uh, spoke Mandarin, only Mandarin, and he was able to show up on scene and give, uh, give aid to that person with the fire department immediately. Um, so I was acknowledging the accolades, uh, the good achievements of my officers, which I think is important. So those are the types of things that I want to share with you all, um, the good things that my department's doing. And through um, the town administrator, I can continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Um, the department will have a vacancy based on who's appointed chief. Uh, describe what qualities you look for in command staff candidates during the promotional process, and what other individuals would you ask to assist you in this process? Um, for this position, you know, the lieutenant is a very important position. I remember you, Sam, when I was running for lieutenant or going for lieutenant, you came to the department and asked to speak to me and you wanted to get to know me because it's such an important position going forward um, because it's the second in command for the department. Uh, so with that being said, the lieutenant handles the operations, the admin part of the job. Uh, I want somebody that's going to be very organized. Uh, educated and has a good ability, I'm sorry, a great, a great ability to get along with others and work and communicate with the other officers in the department. Um, I think it's very important that if a directive comes down from the chief, you have your second in command who's able to explain it and go through the process of what needs to be done. Um, and they're kind of like the sounding board and they, they're basically going to be the person who gets things done for you. So you know, I would be looking for somebody that's going to be able to, to handle that type of volume of work and um, individuals to help me with that. Obviously, the town administrator would be a great help with that. I would actually also reach out to the fire department, the fire chief, and incorporate other other opinions and, and you know, uh, um, thoughts on who they think would be a good candidate. Because, again, we're all working hand in hand and showing up on calls together side by side. So they're going to see a different side of somebody that I may not see from the office. So um, it's going to be a, 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 you know, a big position to fill. And I want to make sure it's done correctly. So thank you. Chelsea, do you have any experience with regional dispatch for police and fire? What do you think are the challenges and or opportunities? I do not have any experience with it. I have been to view an actual, um, regional dispatch facility down in Foxborough. Uh, that was a beautiful facility, uh, very professionalized. And uh, I, I really thought they did a great job when they did when they did a presentation for us and everything. Um, and then what was the second? Um, what do you think the challenges and opportunities? Uh, the challenges will be, as we discussed before, figuring out what to do if, if that was to take place in Southborough. Um, with the lobby area and coming in, somebody coming in. Um, but I think that, you know, that's something that we could definitely figure out together and with feedback. And um, the, what was the second part? Sorry. Opportunities. <laughs> the opportunities. I think it would definitely professionalize the, the, um, the profession itself. I think that it would uh, give us uh, more manpower, more backup for if there is an emergency that happens if all everything happens at once. So thank you. 
As the police chief, one of your greatest roles will be overseeing the budget of the police department. Please illustrate what analysis you will utilize to maximize the operations of a department while staying within financial restrictions and constraints. Discuss how you would manage the overtime um, line item in a year that put excessive demands on the force or community needs. Yep. Um, so it's actually funny, I actually enrolled in a, a budget class. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a three-day class coming up in November, so that uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, I had limited access to the budget um, with the previous chief, um, but if I was taking that on as the current chief, uh, I would have quarterly meetings with um, with uh, Cindy, who's the business administrator. And we've actually done this where we sit down, we go over what's already been spent, what, what we need to watch, what line items we have to worry about, and um, what we have going forward. So I already have a great working relationship with her in establishing what we need to do for this department and keep it running the way it has been. Um, so in, in the second part. How would you manage the overtime budget? Um, obviously just keep track of it. Uh, I have a great department of officers that not everything has to be overtime. Uh, I've, I've asked them if they wanna be a part of something, if they wanna come in and volunteer and, and they have done that on their own. Um, if there is overtime that we need to use, I would just have to limit it to the amount of officers that we could afford to, to pay for that. It's something I would, I would keep an eye on. Ready to. Okay, yeah. um, Andrew. What are the critical elements of training officers to handle calls when they are faced with a mental health emergency? And how would you utilize mental health professionals on these calls? So we had a, a JDP, um, a clinician that works with South Bro, North Bro, and West Bro. Uh, West Bro was the grant owner. They had received the grant. And this year they decided that they were gonna go along on that. So when I found this out, I immediately applied uh, for the DPH for another grant so that we could be the host agency and it brought North Pro in so that they could participate in it as well. So we're actively, I've, we've been through the grant process, DPH has received it, and now we're just waiting for a clinician for them to start the training. Uh, it has been a, a, a major asset for the department to have these JDP clinicians on scene and available to help us. Uh, including doing in-cell assessments where they come into the cell area. If, if a prisoner says they want to commit suicide or whatever it may be, they can come in and determine right then and there if this person needs to be transported to the hospital to get mental, you know, mental health aid. Um, but my offices, um, we, we do training in de-escalation. I think, you know, recognizing um, if somebody is going through a mental health crisis versus if this is something assaulted or violent in nature. Uh, we also we have an annual policy review of our men, handling the mentally ill uh, policy, which we do through our online system, our PMAM system. And um, it's a constant training. And then if I see training that's advertised for um, handling mental health calls, we also do those. I send my officers to those trainings. We're also very lucky to have this facility, this training room here, because any training that's held here uh, for hosting, we can have an extra seat, one or two seats. So those are the trainings that I look for. Lisa. Thank you. Recruiting and retaining police officers is a major challenge for today's police leaders. What are the effective recruiting methods for police departments and what strategies could contribute to improved employee retention? So I'll start at the, the last part of that question. Strategies to retain, I think, is, is creating uh, an environment that people want to work in. Uh, morale is a huge issue. And if you don't address morale, uh, things can go south. So you want to create a department that feels like a family. And I think that we've done that here. Uh, since I've been acting chief, there's been a market, market difference in uh, morale. Uh, morale is, is very high right now. Um, and, and again, it comes back to, we have some great officers that work here. And when you have officers that wanna work here, especially some of your older officers, and then we have hire new officers, they're the ones that are gonna keep them here, keep them happy and keep them in place. 
So again, it's just, it's, it's listening to people, it's being here and creating an environment that people want to work in. And recruiting and um, retaining. Uh, so I had some ideas for recruiting. I think that we should create a recruiting recruitment officer, um, somebody that will go to some of the area colleges like West, I'm um, sorry, um, Worcester State, uh, Framingham State, some of these area colleges that have CJ degrees and go to the, the job fairs that they sometimes put on. And, you know, this department has so much to offer. I think if we go to some of these job fairs with a, with a list of things that our department offers, uh, I think that we're going to have more candidates that would want to sign on to this department versus another department. We have a, a brand new facility. Uh, some of these departments that are looking for offices have older departments, older buildings, um, you know, a beautiful fleet of cruisers um, and offices that, that get along and like to work together. So I, I believe it's important that we go to, we start that funnel from education, offices that can be educated that will come to our department and work for us. And that stops with job, that stops with job fairs. But also I believe in going like there's career days as well in high school. And, and that's part of something that like a, a recruitment officer can go to a career day and talk about the job, you know? Um, I've been to colleges uh, myself while I was a sergeant. I went back to my alma mater at Stonehill and talked to a whole state, like a whole classroom full of, uh, of students, CJ students, and told them how great the job was. And I think we need to bring back that, the, the appeals of this job and go to the people that, that have these CJs degree and want to be in, in this field. So. See ya. Thank you. Um, please provide some examples of how you have mentored or taught others and what was the outcome of your efforts. And second, what training or development do you think is important in developing a succession plan as officers transition through the department? So I always believe in having every position should be too deep, meaning that you should have the person that's doing the position and then should have somebody that's able to shadow that person. So if something were ever to happen to that person or they decided to transfer out of the department, they'll have somebody with at least some of the, the job knowledge and capabilities of what, what that position entails. Uh, and that's something I've always done, especially as a lieutenant. I've, I've made sure that you know, we have a succession plan within each position um, whether it's, you know, the court officer, I have him showing the detective how to download um, videos from, from the cell area and, and things like that, where if, if he were to leave, there's somebody that's going to back him up in that position. Um, and that's, I, I believe in bringing my employees forward. So anything that I see that's going to uh, help them professionally, um, especially if I hear it's a great training, I will send our officers to it. Um, and I have been doing that already since I've been in this position. What examples of mentoring that you've done? Um, without naming names and stuff. Um, yeah, so, you know, being in the lieutenant's position, it was, I was in charge of the detective division. So the, the new detective came in and, you know, I mentored him and what we're looking for and how we handle, you know, investigating cases and the following up and then following up with the victim. Uh, and how important that is. So we go over procedures with him and then I stay available through the whole time that he's in the position as well. Um, you know, just meeting with my sergeants, uh, since I've been in this position, I felt it was very important that I have monthly meetings with my sergeants so I can get a pulse of what's going on in the department and make sure that morale's not going one way or the other. So. I feel like I'm mentoring them for if they want to be in this position as a lieutenant, um, they had something to look for. This is how you handle, uh, you know, um, th those types of meetings. So, thank you. Thanks. Chelsea, police community relations are particularly strained right now across our country. In your current role in the department, what steps have you taken to address issues of race and equity? As chief, what actions would you take to address the, these issues in our community? Good question. Um, I believe strongly in like the social media aspect of, of this job and that we need to be transparent and accountable. And I think that, you know, we built up trust with our community 
if we show them what we're doing and they, and they get used to seeing us and they know what we do. Uh, I started the social media program back in 2009. I created the department's first Facebook account, Twitter account, and website. Um, and at the time, nobody was doing that around here. And it's something I believe strongly. And, you know, eventually I may have to pass that to somebody. I hope not to, because that's kind of my baby, but everything you see on our Facebook page and, and, and our website is, is I put out there. And I think that's important because I think the public, I should think, I know the public wants to know what we're doing and they want to see what we're doing. And it's important to them. And we want to show them what we're doing. And, and that instills confidence and, and, and they, and they, we build up trust with us. Um, and I believe strongly in providing the information that we can give out, we get that out as soon as possible because I think that's important because um, so rumor mill doesn't start immediately. So what we can give out, I plan to give out. Um, and, and, and I think that's very important. Um, I believe also in um, a program that actually the previous chief had in place um, where he had uh, he invited a bunch of um, residents that were people of color in, in our in our town, and I was actually part of it. And we would have them come in, and we took again a tour of the station, and we met on a few occasions, and we had pizza, and and we were able to bounce ideas off of each other. And um, it started right after the George Floyd incident, and I think it was a great segue into. Um, allowing everybody to come into our department and show them that we are your police department. Whatever's going on around the, the country, we are your police department, and that's that's not what's going on here. And just having that fam familiarity, uh, I think, is great. And so now, when you see you know see everybody around town, it's they, they know who you are, and that's a plan, uh, program I, I plan to continue, so. as well as with uh, if. Um, and then look at the time to us. So. Thank you. Thank you. The mental and physical health of every employee within the department is critically important. In your current police role, what steps have you taken to address employee wellness? That's the first question. Um, so there's two questions here. As chief, what actions would you take to support the mental and physical health of the South Rural Police Department employees? Uh, it's always been one of the most important things um, in this job. Um, when I went to Stonehill, I graduated with a double major in criminal justice and psychology. And at one point, I wasn't sure if I was going to go to psychology or clinical, I mean, clinical psychology or criminal justice. I chose criminal justice, but clinical psychology has always been kind of a, like in the back of my mind, and I, I use it in my job all the time. Uh, whenever we have a critical incident that happens, we do a debriefing. And we make sure that the officer, we sit with the officer that went through the debriefing and uh, that went through the incident. And they're aware of our policy. We have a whole policy in place, uh, peer counseling policy with numbers uh, to call. We can't force anybody to get help um, unless it's a fitness for duty situation, but we at least provide them with all the tools that they need if they want to, to seek help after a critical incident. Uh, but mental health is, uh, especially in today's times, um, I have my sergeants always check in with the officers, make sure everybody's doing okay. Uh, and I think that that connection with their immediate supervisor is important. And if something is not going well, or if, you know, if I'm made aware of anything, then we, we take the family approach and we bring everybody in and, and sit down and make sure the person's okay. And, and able to do their job, but also able to, to get through that. So. Thank you. It is often said you shouldn't take a job that does not scare you in some way, shape, or form. What scares you about taking this job? Conversely, what are you most looking forward to? And where do you think your greatest learning curve lies? So it's, so it's three questions. I can read it back. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's funny. I'm not really scared to take this job. I've been doing this since February. I love this job. Uh, I've been building my whole career towards this job. I'm coming up on 24 years as a police officer. Uh, 18 of them have been as a supervisor. Um, and the past three has been as the lieutenant, which is basically the XO, and like I explained, the operations of administration. What am I afraid of? 
from taking the job? I couldn't tell you. Uh, like, I feel like I'm ready for it. Uh, I, and I can't foresee the future. Anything can happen. Um, but I feel like I'm ready for it. My whole career has prepared me for this job. So, um, and then what's that? <laughs> Where do you think your greatest learning curve lies? Uh, greatest learning curve. Uh, it will be, um, I mean, I've already participated in a lot of the committees and gone to a lot of the um, different groups and everything like that, but there is going to be a learning curve for, you know, the capital committee and then going to the SPAC committee and some of these other committees. I haven't had access to that yet in my previous role. I am getting that now. Uh, it's been great. Um, working very well with uh, fellow department heads. Uh, Chief Achilles and I get along great, and John Parent. And, um, you know, that's, so, but in, in the big picture, those are the areas that, um, that there's, there will be a learning curve. And I have people I can rely on and that I can go to if I need help with that. So I feel like I'm prepared for that. Is there a third plan? Uh, what are you most looking forward to? Uh, leading the department to the future. I think that, uh, again, there's so much that we're in the future for this department. and with everybody's with morale being as high as it is, uh, I think we're going to go great places. So. Lisa, thank you. What types of programs and relationships would you build with our schools and other community sectors, such as the seniors? Uh, I've already started, uh, Lisa. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I started the at-risk program, um, which was. Um, you know, I had sat down with Peg Leonard at the senior center and we talked about, you know, this program was stalled. It wasn't going anywhere. So I immediately started working on it with her. I sent her um, something that was already in place in Hopkinton and she sent back, well, what if we change the form here? And we worked together in collaboration and came up with this at risk form. And then on top of it, we're able to incorporate um, memory. Uh, those uh, individuals suffering from memory, memory loss issues like Alzheimer's, dementia, but also uh, autism. And we created this form that's basically a response form for when officers respond to the home, um, with certain triggers that the officers have to watch out for, it basically is a cost. It's all voluntary, uh, not forced on anybody if they want this in place uh, for uh, emergency response to their home, they can have it. Uh, in the schools, um, when I first got into position, it was um, a lot of learning. And then right near the end of the school year, I, in June, uh, I came up with the uh, lunch take back program, which I had actually seen online from my hometown department. I thought it was great because it was something you could do during the school day without affecting curriculum for, for the school, for the school day. And uh, my officers loved it. We had about 12 officers show up and serve lunch and and the parents, uh, you know, parents are calling and just everyone had a great time. Chelsea came. And it was, it was so the, these are the types of programs. I don't think there's anything wrong with if you see something that works, bring it to this department and bring it to this town. Uh, I think ideas are there for sharing. And, you know, that was something that I saw that I really felt like we could do here. And I have a great relationship with surrounding town chiefs. I know a lot of them and I'm working I'm looking forward to collaborating with them on the trainings. Um, at one point in Westboro, we had the active shooter training at the old um, movie theater that was in town. I thought that was a great training and it's stuff that I'd like to bring back now that COVID is done. Um, slow down. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, this is what I hope is a very hypothetical question. Okay. Uh, assume that the select board instructs you to implement a new policy and you don't agree with this policy, you think it's a bad idea, what do you do? I would request to have meetings with you and I would have, I would just make sure that I have all the information on the background of why we want to put this policy in place. Once I feel like I had all the information and I could explain it to my department, um, I, would, I would move forward with it. It's, you know, I've, I would hope that as a department head, I would be able to uh, uh, give my opinion and my take on it. And um, from what I know of this board, uh, I, I don't see that as being a problem. Um, but I think it's important that it, if it's something that's going to be unpopular, that it's work we work together on. And then I would, I would bring it back to the department. And then I would start immediately with the meeting with my sergeants, because 
as of right now, with no lieutenant, they're the ones that are going to be bringing the message down to the troops. Thank you. Thank you. So, the South Park Police Department will soon be implementing body cameras. What policies and procedures surrounding body cameras would you would be important to you as chief regarding this rollout? So I already um, reached, I was able to acquire nine different department policies for body worn cameras. Um, and I'm actively reviewing those to see what's what would work for our department. Some of them are bigger departments, some of them are smaller departments. So that's something that I'm in the process of doing. Um, but I always, I wanna make sure that there's a system in place for, obviously for the accountability and transparency, but also protecting privacy of the people that we encounter uh, within the community. Last question. Um, it's a long one, so stay with me. There's only one question at the end of it. I just gotta get to it. Um, an effective chief needs to deal fairly, objectively, and consistently with members of the department and with the public. Any internal candidate brings a history of personal relationships with his department colleagues and with the public to the position of chief. How will you ensure that these relationships, these existing relationships, will not get in the way of your ability to work fairly? objectively and consistently with the individuals and issues you will need to deal with as chief? So I started in 2002. By 2004, I was promoted to sergeant. So I've been in a supervisor role for 18 years out of my 20 in South Park. Uh, I've always established there's certain guidelines, there's certain things that you can do in front of me, there's certain things you cannot do in front of me. Um, I attend weddings with with the officers, I attend you know, certain special occasions, um, but it's not something that like I'm worried about. They know what my role is within this department. And my trajectory was always heading towards this. And I absolutely do not see this as being an issue within my department, especially now that I've been acting chief since February. Um, my guys have embraced me in this role and uh, Immediately begin, you know, calling chief, and 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 um, you know, they know that this is my role. This is this is what I'm going to be doing for as a leader of the department. Uh, so I do not, I'm not worried about it at all. Although um, I I've already established what my role is here and where that, you know, that disconnect is uh, as a supervisor and as a leader. And there was, what was the last question? No, that was the question. It was just a long <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah. There's only one question on that one. Okay. So that was it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's 15 questions. Um, All right. Well, bye-bye, didn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so um, to wrap up, would you please take this opportunity to um, make a closing statement or to provide any information that you think would be beneficial for this board to know beyond what we already know that's in your resume? Um, like I said, you know, I've been, uh, I've been in this profession. I've actually had a rest power since I was 20 years old. Um, I worked as a summer special in Nantucket. Uh, I went to Stonehill College and then I worked on Nantucket as a summer special police officers with full police power uh, back and forth for four summers while I was in college. And, uh, you know, this, it's something that I used to walk with the foot patrol and it was a great way to like, it really kind of, got me started in community policing because I was in full uniform walking up and down Main Street of Nantucket, talking to people, um, you know, talking to the vendors, helping people with traffic. And it was the old school community policing. And that's the, the concept that I brought to this job ever since. That was when I was 19, 20 years old. And, you know, so, and then on top of it, so for 24 years, I've been in this profession, like I said, 18 as a supervisor. Um, I'm at that point in my career where I'm ready for this leadership role in this position and the training that I've acquired, I, as you see in my resume, uh, has prepared me for this position. Um, I have, I'll go into a personal life. I have a wife of 21 years, uh, just celebrated our 21st anniversary. And I have three teenagers in full teenage mode. It's 16, 18, and 19, that one in college. So. My life is, is, you know, is busy, but everyone knows that this department is my, my priority on top of you know, with family, obviously families first, but um, 
So again, uh, I'm ready for this position. I'm ready for this role. I've already been doing this job since February. I've, uh, I've established some great relationships with other department heads. Uh, Chief, like I said before, Chief Achilles, John Parent. Um, and I feel like if I want to collaborate with anybody, I can do that immediately and I know who to go to. This, just like this morning, I was with uh, Greg Martineau, the superintendent of schools, and I was in the auditorium with the 800 teachers. And as he introduced me as South Florida's interim chief, and uh, it's great to be a part of that and, and be part of the community for that, you know, for that situation. So, yes, so I am ready for this position if uh, you choose to choose me for it. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, and thank you for going through this process with us. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, so everyone will recall that what we agreed to do when we first set up the process for this is to do the interview tonight sleep on it, come back tomorrow night, and vote, discuss and vote. Um, Mr. Purple, um, in his um, giveaway, said what you may want to do is go ahead and add some flexibility. So we have posted tonight's meeting so that if we thought we were ready to vote, no one wanted to sleep on it, um, we could go ahead and discuss um, what we heard tonight and decide um, whether we would want to appoint one of the two gentlemen as the next police chief. Um, or we can do what we originally planned, which is sleep on it and come back at seven o'clock tomorrow night with that being the only item on the agenda, no public comment, no anything. So, and I've also said that if anyone wants to come tomorrow night, they hold the veto so they, that it's not going to be a majority vote because that's what we said we we're going to do to begin with. Okay, so my question to all four of you is, by good to me, is does anyone want to come back, sleep on this and come back tomorrow night? So, bye. So you're I'm, ready to you ready tonight? Yeah. yeah Andrew, yeah. Chelsea, yeah. Lisa, so I really hate to be the naysayer in this, but I really want to. So um, Hassan's promise you're going to get this on YouTube right away. Um, so I really do want to sleep on this. Um, go back and listen to the interviews again and really think through this because it's such an important. And I know you all agree this. Is discussion so um don't be mad at me um but i really would like to to take tonight to really think about it and we'll come back tomorrow night and, um, no problem okay yeah. i hate to be um oh, i was hoping someone else wanted to today i don't have to be the only but we are here but um anyway lisa is that okay okay all right okay so that's our plan so then um what we're going to do now is go ahead to our second agenda item which is reviewing the warrant as it stands tonight um, and it's kind of hot off the press and then we'll do public comment after we do that okay all right and we will have an executive tomorrow night yeah so yes. there'll be two agenda items but yes okay yes so we'll do the executive session to start the process if we do appoint any police chief tomorrow night immediately there after okay. but no public comment tomorrow night. no executive session tonight no right so that was there in case we were going to um, appoint police chief tonight Okay, so um, can I your comments? Absolutely. Okay, so time's passing. October 13th will be here before we know it. Um, so again, remind us of when you want to go to the printer, the 21st? 21st, yes. So the, the goal is that at your meeting on the 7th, you will officially close the warrant. Um, and then um, on the 20th, you will sign the final version of the warrant, go to the printer on the 21st. And we um, should have that back hopefully within a week um, and then have that available for um, for the committee's residents to get ready for the meeting on the 13th. Okay. And um, advisory has specifically okay. asked today if you could postpone your plans by one day because they want to meet on the 21st. Yes. Yes. But we could probably, yeah, we could probably do it that. Yeah. Okay. They will appreciate sure. it. I remember those days. Yeah. Maybe that extra day was very important. Okay. So let's just run through each article and kind of see what we think about for this stand. Um, so one, two, three, and one, two, and three are all related. So the first one, of course, is the one we promised to know first from Breger Town Meeting, which is the um, new trees bylaw. Okay, so 
I think we're just waiting for Sandy to finish their hearing on this and say they're done, ready. Um, I assume we don't, no one wants to vote to really know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, so everybody agree <laughs> yeah. that we're waiting until we see the exact wording on that one, right? We kind of know what's coming for that one. Lisa, um, okay, you agree? Okay, so you're muted. I can see your head nodding though, so. Sorry, yes, I agree, Kathy, sorry. All right, so number two, of course, is scenic roads. Um, I mean, this one's pretty cut and dry. Um, you know, either you want to make them all safe roads or you don't. That's what that's your choice here, right? The rest of the roads, other than the state roads. So I doubt this one's going to change very much as far well, as. Well, the planning board has been talking about some different options. Okay, so we'll wait on this so one too then. I don't know exactly how strongly they feel about the choices, but Marnie Houlihan was talking about some of the feedback they've got. So. But you would yeah. think in the end, there's kind of two, well, three choices. You don't like it at all. Or number one or two, you like it. Yes, make them all that you can. Or number three, the kind of middle ground, which is actually try to figure out what scenic and make them scenic. Yeah, you know, and not process. just for all yeah. breath, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So door one, door two, and door three. So we'll see. Okay, so we're going to wait on that one too. Okay, Chelsea, you want to talk about three? Sure. You're working with Karen yes. on that one. So Karen went out to bed. Um, on the list of trees that we approved at the hearings. Um, and as of last Thursday, she had not received the bid. And Mark, I don't know if you received anything. So tonight. she didn't go out to bid. Oh. MAPC went, went out, out to bid, bid. Yeah. and we became, we asked to be part of that. Right. So when that bid is done, we will get a list of here's the results, here's what the vendors gave us, and here's what the pricing is. And I believe if I understood her correctly, the pricing is going to come back per inch. She right. says, we've never bid trees like this before. So it'll be interesting. So given that we've got all this information, because you saw the charts for all the trees that we reviewed, yeah. we'll be able to very quickly say pricing, size, pricing separate, and put that yeah, together. And then we'll have an idea of what it's actually going to cost us to move these trees. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many inches there are? Have you tried no. to edit it up? Well, I just wondered. No, okay. I haven't done that. But we know it's, it's a, the measurement's what, BDH, breast diameter height, yeah, breast diameter BDH. So we know what it is, right? It's on the spreadsheet. We know what it is. Exactly. So we really could add it up. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted, do we have, I just, would, I like to know what the ballpark is. Um, so. But we don't know price per inch, so yeah. we can calculate yeah. the inches. But. I mean, um, we've got, there's a piece of land that my neighborhood basically controls. It's 26 acres. And we have to deal with trees a lot. And lately we've had, last two years we've had a lot of trees and it's always been like a thousand to 2000 per tree. And we thought we had a big price. So I assume we're talking at least hundreds of thousands here, you know, um, I hope it's not much more than that. Is yeah. this an APC process, something they're bidding for uh, several towns together or is it just- Exactly. So this is kind of like the process price. the CMRPC did for the yeah, self yeah. transition plan for the ADA Title II. Yeah. And you know we were getting involved, and they said, "Well, we're bidding it for everybody." We said, "Okay, we're not going to do all the work ourselves. We'll get in." They helped us apply for the MOD grant the whole night. So this is the same type of process. They're doing this for their for their communities. And when do we think we'll have? I believe we should have something this week. So Miss um, Galligan is is, um, is taking some well well needed vacation this week. Um, and um, but we're keeping an eye on when those results become available because we can apply that information as soon as it's available. One question that has come up in the past on this is that some people believe that there's great value in the wood and the trees that they're taking out, and uh, have asked uh, do, the, do the bidders actually recognize that in terms of offsetting the cost for that? Has that been is that part of the bid I think process? The great person that asked that was you, wasn't it? No, 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 I, I, it had, I, I seem to remember your name was attached with that I, question. I, I it know. has been asked recently, um, know, and question. the answer was. But I do think you are I do think he did say that that is taken into account when they do bid, it, it because, they, because there is there is a there is a value. So hopefully, the, the bidding process yeah. sort of reinforces that as, as the opportunity for the bidder to to assign some value to that. Sure, I agree. Some work. Okay, same, or, uh, Mark, you want to talk about four? Sure, Article Four. Um, if you remember, uh, at the um, uh, last spring, just before the annual meeting, we were able to get um, all but fire department union um, ratified. Um, this board actually ratified the agreement. Um, and the, uh, the fire union did not, so it didn't go forward to town meeting. So we're still proceeding under 
the existing uh, contract until there's a replacement um, in place. Um, we've been uh, meeting at the table. Um, I think that um, you know we have a, a clear path forward. Um, I did say um, that it would be um, a little embarrassing if we couldn't get this done. I think we we're very close, um, and I think that, um, and I'll give Chief Achilles credit, you know, in, in, in helping to try to work through some of the um, um, lingering issues that that I think you know helped us or, or prevented us from getting there the first time. So uh, Chief is is coming back uh, this week midweek. We'll meet at the end of this week. Um, I believe we'll start to uh, get things in process. I don't believe I'll have anything for you to consider um, on the seventh, um, but we'll have something for you to consider um, for ratification on the twentieth. I will not bring it to you until the union has ratified. So last time I brought it to you for ratification, you know I thought you know we were there. I thought everything was all set. I wouldn't have brought it to you otherwise. So uh, this time when the fire union ratifies it, I would bring it to you. I would expect another 20th. All right, so we'll be optimistic on that. Yes. All right, now the next one, um, five and six have a connection. So five is, this is called the clicker article where um, we are going to test out clickers for the first time as far as some votes. Um, I'm not sure we're going to use them for all votes, but the ones that we think there might be a um, close vote. Um, so we don't have to spend all the time we do trying to count votes. So we're going to try it. Um, Mr. Haggerty and Mr. Samino seem to have come to a meeting of their minds as far as doing this. Um, so um, this is the language that we're seeing right now. They both have agreed on, I believe. That is my understanding. So this is so the town clerk provided this to me today. Um, so I wanted to make sure you had the most updated language that you um, that you were playing with. So my understanding from Mr. Hegarty is that both he and Mr. Samino agree with this language. Mr. Samino insisted um, that you know the town approve this before he he could have done this on his own. I think said as to quickness, but he wanted to make sure the town voted for it before he agreed to it. So this is he wants he wanted, I think he wants a clear direction. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, the plan is to use it for the first time at annual town meeting, and the next article uh, funds the initial um, payment, which is to rent them to see if we're going to want them before we buy them. I think the purchase price is either thirteen or eighteen. Um, I think it's thirteen. I think. I think, I think, I think that Go ahead. I, I think it's a option to purchase, right? So the total price I think is eighteen. You rent them for five if you go ahead and purchase them. What you what you paid to rent them goes toward the purchase price. Yeah. So if you like them, your total outlay to purchase them will be thirteen. Um, and and just so the board knows, these are just placeholder numbers. Um, I see that the capital chair happens to be with us tonight. Um, but um, but other than the clickers, the pavement management system um, that, that had been talked about here and also with capital, um, that bid is um, is due on Wednesday. Of this week, and so um, uh, probably early next week, um, we'll sit down and review those bids and have a recommendation to the board for um, award, obviously contingent upon funding. So, okay, so if five were to fail, and it's a you know it's a majority vote, if it were to fail, then we would um, pull the first part of six or indefinitely postpone. So that's why six comes after five because you're not going to find something that. They didn't prove, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think that you'll have the bids, so we'll have this number firmed up soon as far as the payment management systems. Correct. Right? Yes. Okay. 50 is, is a guess. I, I think that's a just, it, it's a guess. It's a, you know, I, I don't know what the market for, for these uh, systems is now. Someone had, had uh, mentioned, I believe, that, you know, somewhere maybe around 50. Yeah, that's but we think actually it's, consistent. I've talked with several of these vendors over the last couple of years. Yeah. And that is consistent with what I've heard, although that's not South for a specific. Right. But generally speaking, 30 to 50 kind of numbers people have uh, thrown for the out first there. year for, for the first evaluation process and sort yeah. of getting the thing going. Yeah. But again, it's going to depend on size of community, number of road miles, all of those yeah, to some extent. Type of yes, yeah. there's some of that. But then there's the open the software, then the, the sure. short 10 miles or a thousand. Sure. Miles kind of thing. And again, we're not on the front edge of the wave anymore. That's right. Right. So this has been established. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I think that that may be reflected in the price. All right, so we're not making the payment management system. Excuse me. Wait. Okay, can I ask a question of about course. that? So just because this this is topic has come up at various meetings. Um, 
the community compact grant, were we going to apply for that? Is that related to what something different? I, I remember I thought, Karen saying that. Yeah, she was going to. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll let Miss say it. Well, I'll start the answer and then okay. Miss Hale can talk from some of the experience that we've had with the Community Compact Grant. Community Compact Grant has been good um, to help us for studies and for, um, um, you know, for smaller implementation. Um, I'm not sure whether it could be helpful with this. I know that when we went back and we took a look at identifying you know, where our pinch points were in our record retention and trying to improve our systems. And, um, um, you know, we had got, uh, um, Ms. Hale had, had shepherded a um, community compact grant for that. And we had done the, done, the, um, uh, done the report. We had money left over. We couldn't spend it on implementing for anything from the report. Um, so I'm not sure whether or not that would be something that, you know, we could use this for. We could take a look at this. I don't know whether there's, you know, there's potentially some history that um, we could get the funding. I'm not sure if they would go to, uh, you know, to fifty thousand dollars or not. Um, but again, I don't know what the numbers are, and we could look at that once we know what the number actually is. It really been helps. Is yeah. that related to the housing choice in MBTA communities? If we actually don't stay on track with that, is that one of the areas that our ability to get money is going to be limited? I think you're right. I think those are going to create again pinch points. Yeah, yeah I think I think that was specific. There's a list eligibility, I mean, correct? Three, and that's one. one. I think that's going to limit. That will limit your eligibility. Um, yeah, I agree with this one. All right, so that one's moving along. Um, seven um, is YouTube. Yeah, Lisa, do you want to speak to that? I know Lisa has identified something. First of all, we're meeting about this tomorrow. <laughs> Sure, Andrew. So I had actually pulled some language, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, from another town. And um, I think it's a great starting point. It's very brief, very succinct. And Andrew and I are going to talk about it on Wednesday. So we should have um, hopefully some language at least send over to Jay and get his opinion on. Does that sound about right, Andrew? Yes. And I think that some of it, the the, the model that um, Lisa found it was specific that the, the purpose of the fall town meeting is focused on non fiscal articles, which I think is the focus. Non financial. Non financial. Um, I think an issue is going to be should the bylaw have a specific target about like what week or when in the month it should be? You know, is it mid October or early November, or late October? I think that's one of the well, you know, um, and, and I know I'm repeating myself, but um, at the regular town meeting, um, advisory is going to tell the town what they think passing that budget will do to their taxes, right? They say, this is what, based on what we know, there's some more things they have to go into it, but we estimate your tax increase is going to be, you know, two, three percent, whatever. Um, I fully support the notion that the special town meeting should have nothing to do with money. Um, that, that should have been out of the way with the budget because I just think you're 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 undoing what we told the, the um, town meeting, and therefore it's not fair for them to vote on a budget that they think they understand the tax increase, and then later on shove some more stuff in it, and so that's really not what tax increase is. And if you agree with that, then I think you've got more flexibility as far as when the special fall town meeting is because you're not worried about um, yes. messing up Paul's belly as he's trying to finalize the tax rate, that's right? Mm -hmm. It's less of an issue if you if you're able to maintain the non-financial, right? Yeah. Then Mr. Savelli cares less because okay. it's not affecting it's not affecting the tax rate piece. So we're going to do a few things and then run back to this one, but then maybe for now we just say we're not going to do it. Well, I guess I, I think they need to have a small amount of flexibility there. If something comes up, we do need to do, do a financial thing. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like this one's going to get done, Lisa and Andrew, right? It's going to go. Let's go. Okay. All right. Um, so everybody, you happy with the discussion on that one? Okay. All right. So the next one is the possible um, proposal to increase the CPA surtax from one to three percent. So we haven't talked about that one um, very much. So I thought we, we should really get into that one tonight. Um, decide whether we can 
think you should go forward on that because we are going to have to, um, it's going to be our article or our CPCs one. Um, it started with advisory in the last year and a half or so. Um, Andrew Mills was part of that discussion, so he at least knows about it, but he, I don't think he's talked about it with CPC, um, the whole committee, but he was very pleasantly surprised that we were even interested in doing this. Um, and the reason we were interested in doing it, remember we've talked a lot about trying to um, enhance, increase non-levy revenue so that, you know, we try to control the tax rate. So try to, you know, you want to increase um, the meals tax because you've got people coming in paying it from outside South Pearl. Increase your state revenue. So again, you take the pressure off the levy. Um, so what's happened with the CPA um, um, account is that over the last few years, the state, which matches a piece of what we generate locally, has significantly increased the pool that um, goes into determined state match. They doubled the fees. So you they doubled the fee at the registry from $25 to $50 a process. Um, and then the one for municipal liens, I went from even more, 10 to 25. So the amount of money that's going into the state pool that they then disseminate to um, match what you collect locally has increased enormously. On top of that, um, the state the last few years has actually just put in a pool of money. They, they put in $20 million in because they had enough money in the budget to do it. Now, ironically, they agreed to do it this time, but because of this um, um, law that's going to kick in, that's going to refund a piece of income taxes. That's actually on hold right now, but that's okay. So what we did on advisory when we started looking at this, we did, um, we did some computations, and roughly um, we're taking in right now about $500,000 between what we collect locally with the 1% and what the state gives us. That's what we get right now, right? It's been going up. You know, you went down for a while. It used to be higher than it went down, and now it's come back up because of this increase in fees, right? So if you were to triple the um, surtax, go from one to three percent, you don't get just three times the state net. You get a bonus because you went to three. You only get if you go to three. Two won't do it. One and a half won't do it. If you'll go from one to three, the state gives you more than just three times the one percent. Um, and it's about $100,000. So instead of collecting $500,000 a year, we collect about a million six if we were to increase it from one to 3%. Um, so you say, well, okay, it's still increasing taxes. So, you know, if you do the math, let's take a $500,000 house, right? Subtract 100,000, you got $400,000, multiply it times the tax rate, you've got I think $6,400 of taxes, and then multiply that times 1%. So right now, a $500,000 house is paying $64, so they would pay three times that, $192, right? So 64, so that's what they go to. But if you're going to use that money anyway, and all you've done is shifted it from the tax levy to, to, to CPA, CPC, then you really haven't increased taxes, but instead you've actually generated more money for Southport because you've got that extra state match coming in. So what do we have coming up that we might need more CPA money for? Well, you've got quite a bit of um, capital improvement projects on the um, slate for Algonquin that would probably qualify bills, et cetera. Um, we've got some other things that could be done in South if we wanted to with this money. Um, so I think there is a good reason to think about doing this. I don't know if now is a time or during your time, it's a time to do it. So to me, that's, that's discussion. Do we really think we want to do it now? Because I think you gotta make a good case for it. When this passed originally, it didn't. It failed at town meeting, fifty-one to forty-nine. But they and they did try to start off with the three percent, but it fell fifty-one forty-nine. Then it passed because it was a ballot initiative, so it actually passed on the ballot at one percent the following year. So some residents got together, got, got on ballot, and then it passed. So that's how we've got it. There's one hundred eighty-nine communities in Massachusetts right now that have the um, surtax, and seventy-five of those have the three percent. So we be we you know it's almost half and not quite half almost half. I, so. I think the numbers are there. The, the challenge I think is that uh, if the town can be disciplined in terms of spending that additional money for things that we would have done anyway, right. the taxpayers come out ahead. If in fact we look at that as bonus money that we can spend on top of what we would otherwise spend, then in fact that does impact the tax rate. Exactly. So I think that to me is the, the real choice. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, at least, you know, most of us are not going to be here for the next 10 years or whatever in terms of doing that discipline. So I think it's important to reinforce that message that uh, uh, that's part of the deal here. And hopefully some of the boards will support that uh, down the road. We can pass this. 
But I think it's great to get the state that's an extra million bucks in state money, which is uh, not insignificant in terms of impact on taxpayers. No, it's year after year after year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, you know, you can bond the CPA, so you, you could do you know, quite a bit of projects. I don't think it's just discipline, though. I think you've got to see what you've got in projects and what fits in the CPA boxes. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing, too. And because and how many times have you been at town meeting or residents have said, why can't we use CPA? Oh, I can't, you know, and not understanding exactly what it can be used for. So I agree. So whether it's capital or a combination of capital advisory and select board, take a look at what your planning is laid out for you and whether you think, you know, what you think will fit in there and how that could potentially be used. I think that's really what's going to help make the case. Well, and I also think CPC needs to come and explain what hasn't been able to be done because they don't have enough funding or they don't have people coming to them looking but for they projects. They control how it's used too. So right. you need to understand so their think, philosophy. Right. I also think this plays into one of our goals for this year on the five-year plan and looking at what what the outlay is with you know things that are not CPC funded. We know we have a lot of capital things mm -hmm. coming up that can't be CPC. So I'd like to see like the broader picture and how this would play in and have a more formalized plan on CPC projects. You know, sometimes too, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Thank you. No, I just, I, I think it's definitely something worth exploring, but I think I worry in trying to get it done before October, we haven't had a conversation with CPC yet and we haven't done any outreach to the public. And I think there's gonna be some level of um, having to sell this to people. I think people are just gonna view this as their taxes are increasing irregardless of you know, the points you just brought up, Kathy. So my fear is, do we have enough time to do this and get this done before the warrant closes and before October's town meeting? I totally agree with everything you said because you know you don't want to rush into it and then it fails and then you where are you? So you know, and sometimes too, if you match the projects with what you're doing and saying, you know, this is why we want to do this because we really, you know, it's time now to pay our share of the new turf field at Algonquin, whatever. Um, and that's that's a bad example because apparently CPC won't do you turf fields, turf, right? right? So that's a bad, but <laughs> something else there that it will qualify for. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where I'm falling down too, that we really need to get CPC in here, mm -hmm. you know, see what they say, because um, they certainly will have an opinion on this, um, decide who's, you know, if they agree, and then uh, maybe look forward to trying to do this at the regular town meeting in the spring. I actually agree also, but I think it, it, it works a little differently in the sense that I've heard CPC opine a number of times that they don't initiate projects. They simply evaluate requests for CPC funding. So I think it's up to the groups like us, like the Capital Planning Committee, for example, and others who have projects in the pipeline to come out with a plan and say, here's what we expect to do over the next 10 years or whatever. And these things appear to be uh, consistent with CPC funding. So let's take a look and see if we don't have enough to, to use the increment here, then maybe it's not a good idea. But I bet that there are a number of things that folks uh, have on the, on the agenda that uh, would fit. And that's, I think, goes back to the other point that you can explain that easier to sell to people. That here's, here's the purpose of it, and here's how it saves money for the average taxpayer as a package as opposed to what is going to be So, totally agree. I mean, I think we're all on the same page here. We just need a little bit more time to get this fleshed out and do it right so that we really are coherent and can make the case that needs to be made. Because I think Lisa's right. We got to sell it uh, and, and justify this and not just. Um, um, Act like we're trying to, you know, triple the the um, surtax for no no reason. Here's what you get for it. I also think that this is something I, I would rather see on an annual town meeting. I just don't know what on here is going to attract a lot of people to come. Well, that is it, too, right? That is so, the reason to put it on there. Um, so because I, I think we do have that. Well, is our corn still 100 for 20? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. I just, I would like to have more people weigh in on this one and get more buy-in rather than, you know, I think if this had been the Unlasters, it may have been a little bit different. I just don't know what the the draw is going to be on this one. Yep. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm still a little worried about the comments we're going to have for this uh -huh. one uh, because I just don't think there's anything really earth-shattering out there so far. 
And I won't even call it this or shame, but this might bring people up, but I don't think there's a reason to do it. I still think we yeah. have the right idea. Let's do it right. Let's get CPC in here and mm -hmm. see what they think and then um, decide what to do from there. Yeah. At least it's not in Everybody agree? Yeah. Okay, so that one comes up. Yep. Okay. Hear it. All right, let's see. Create a fund to replace trees that are removed. So let me start this one, Lisa, and then you, you take it up, okay? Um, so Lisa and I had a meeting not too long ago with Mimi Luttrell and, and Mark's office to talk about this. Um, she, she really wants to make sure that we have a process in place that when we take a tree down, we replace it somehow, some way. Maybe it's not there someplace else, right? So at least one for one. And of course, you have to have money to, to buy new trees. And um, you know, our 85K budget that we've got DP Debbie now can only go so far, right? Funds are arborists, and et cetera. So um, I, I think it's a laudable, noble idea. I just don't think it's ready for prime time for this. Again, I'm trying to keep the money off of here. So I, th I, I think we should pick it up. I think we should um, talk about it, but I still think it's an annual town meeting um, um, time because it's money. And this really could wait. Um, and uh, we really think through how to do it um, and, and make sure that we get it for annual time. So I met with Mimi last week on this. And um, I think she has a lot of good ideas to get a policy in this to then dovetail into a maintenance article that would encompass replacing trees and ongoing maintenance of removal of trees. So having one larger article or maintenance article for um, annual town meeting that would then turn over every year. Um, so I think she's just working through some things on her side, comparing what other towns do, and then we'll work on a policy first and then figure out how much um, we, she would want to do that for annual. And that's actually what we suggested that day because she's going toward a new bond fund. So we kind of we're trying to not because number one, where are you going to fund it with? She's she talking about the fees you're going to fund yeah, it with. Yeah, So I hope that is off the table because um, we don't need another the problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, an article like John Karen has for that is yeah. probably fit. I just think it's not something you should do with this one, but you should do it in the annual time meeting when we're doing all the budget stuff. Mm -hmm. Planning board is going to be okay with that. I think. I, I can talk, I can follow up again with her okay. this week um, and ask her in her board to okay. um, discuss this at their next meeting. It sounds like the similar rationale we just had at the CPA discussion yeah, is that good idea. We think we need something like this. We just don't think we want to rush it. Mm -hmm. Try to get it ready. Right. You know, okay. And we, we want, want to keep the money off of all town meetings. We want the money to go to annual town meetings. Right. And, and encompass it so that we're not forgetting anything. Right. And yeah. make, make sure we think through everything that goes into um tree and you need to figure out how much too so you guys need time to really think mm -hmm. what it should be funny right you know? and we wrote we looked at the last five years of um the art uh, the line item in dpw um as well to get a sense for arborists tree removal that kind of thing so we're going through the historical data all right chelsea on that, that one's on you yeah okay all right so question mark on that one um Next one is the bylaw to establish the timelines and deadlines for warrant article submission. I did a draft of this last year that got pulled. And this was again after conversation with Mr. Haggerty to provide timing for the publication of the warrant without last minute citizen petitions, particularly in a way that would also allow flexibility for citizen petitions in a reasonable way. And uh, I, I continue to believe that would be useful from an administrative standpoint, but you do need to have it in the bylaw somewhere because now there's no limitation on timing for a citizen petition. So they could produce one you know, the day before town meeting, presumably, it would not be great administratively for a variety of reasons. Well, I thought that Mr. Tellerman told us that we learned something from him, which is because we always thought, I mean, we cut it off, right? Yeah. Well, you're we thought we could do that. Yeah. And they learned we can't, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that until the warrant's printed, a citizen could submit a petition. Is that yeah. what we, that, that's what he told us, right? Until, yeah. until you've signed the final Post warrant and it's posted. Right. So you couldn't do it the day before, but you yeah. could do it 10 days before. Correct. Right. And right. the alternative to that is unless you have a bylaw 
that sets out the guidelines, then you can stand on that. So this would be the draft bylaw would be that you could close the war and also be the date to close any citizens' petitions. Um, I actually can't remember what I wrote that because it, it's more flexible than that, I think. But, okay. but again, to create a process that's clear, that is reasonable, doesn't prohibit people from doing things that are So you've got a proposed bylaw ready to go? I've got a draft that I need to think about again and talk with Jay. Okay. We could have that. So you'll do that and then yeah. circulate it? So, yeah. All right, so that's still a possibility. Yes. Yeah. Right? All right, number 11, um, National Grid. So Mark, you want to talk about this one? Sure. So um, John Parent has been working with our um, energy consultants um, and um, is looking to um, bring any EV charging stations out here to the uh, police side, the public safety building, because we are um, uh, moving towards uh, hybrid vehicles uh, for the cruisers and then um, you know, I think that's eventually just going to lead to electric uh, and um, looking to do that for no cost to the town. However, we can't do anything with it or get any um, proposals or anything from, um, from National Grid if they don't have the easement to bring the power up here. And um, in speaking with um, town council, uh, there's a couple of different utilities that you can do without easement. One of them is water, the other is sewer. Electric isn't one of those. So we need to go to town meeting for this. I think it's a pretty easy ask. We're not looking um, to, um, to expend any money on this. Again, shifting our vehicles, um, uh, some of our cruiser vehicles to electric is going to increase some of our electric, but that's going to be offset in reductions in fuel. So um, I think that you know it's a benefit. Um, we're seeing departments going this way. And I think we're just trying to um, a few minutes ago, I said, you know, we're not on the front side of the, of the wave with the paper management. I think we're closer to the front, you know, when it comes to, you know, some of the uh, um, uh, the hybrid and the, the electric vehicles. So, um, yeah, I don't think this is much of an argument. It's more of a procedural item just to get the, the approval for the board to be able to do this. Everybody agree with that one? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. But I think larger question, is this something that uh, we uh, should be thinking about for other locations? Like townhouse, for example, DPW, I've seen cases where uh, you have a third party come in and install the equipment mm -hmm. and charge for the electricity. So the town presumably wouldn't have much cost for that. Right. Is that something that National Grid would do for us or do we have to go to other third parties? To do so that? I think that there, you know, I would, I would, you know, for Mr. Parent, I'd lean on the energy consultants to see if there are those opportunities out there. But the second part of, so the first part of the article identifies 32 Porterville and council suggestion was the second part and such other town owned locations as the select board may determine for a similar purpose. But this would be for National Grid only here because of the way this is written or if XYZ company came in and said, I want to put charging stations at the, the uh, you know, townhouse, for example. You have to grant well, you're gonna need you're gonna need to bring the power in the national grid. So national so, grid's gonna yeah. have to bring the power yeah. in, I think, regardless. Yeah. yeah. But it may be a third, uh, you know, third party provider yeah. that is able it to utilize to that to. It doesn't need the easement because the power will exist. But you've got to grant the easement to allow them to come across okay. your property. Guess, so yeah, I don't know the whole technical details, but it'd be great if we had a structure that allowed for. I agree. Others to come in. Without having to do this, every time. Well, that's so that's why council suggested that last part, which gives the board, you know, and whether or not town meeting is willing to give the board that latitude to be to allow the utility to cut to bring power in, you know, for this purpose. But I the, think they will. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people very happy about this. I think so too. I think so. But again, I guess if I were doing it more generally, you might say the Massachusetts Electric Company or other power providers. I don't know how wide you can make it yeah, without, right. you know. Um, right. Anyway, I, I support yeah. this certainly, yeah. but. Uh, but but I, I, you know what, I will ask Mr. Parent the question as to, you know, I mean, what, even if we're having a third party come in to provide the service, yeah. would grid still need the easement? So it's not that you need to give, yeah. you don't need to give them an easement to come into the property to do that, but you're going to engage with a third party to provide a service on your property. Right. 
And I think grid is the only one who sells electricity in town, right? Yeah. Although there are other uh, aggregators or whatever. But well, their wires. they control the transmission. Yeah, they got Correct. The transmission. So they are the ones that are going to control. Need, yes, need they'll okay. control that end of it. Okay. You know, Kevin Barrington asked us in an email at some time recently um, whether we were going to do this. You mentioned Marlboro, you know, you could let the parking meter yeah. just put the coins in to do yeah. it. Um, and um, therefore, maybe Marlboro um, can help us here as far as how we take this to make sure. I, I, think, I think there's some, you know, there's some possibilities for location. I think one of them we talked about is potentially the library. Yeah. But I think we need to finish that project next door <laughs> before we start doing something over at the library. So right. um, one so step at a time. That, and that's a great location in terms of accessibility from, you know, um, from a lot of a lot of different areas. So yeah. it sounds like we're done with another making as flexible as we can without yeah. um, causing too many questions. Okay, so that looks good. Yeah. All right. Um, next one. Um, Lisa, um, you want to handle this one as far as what? Well, first of all, are we? I thought that. Shopsy was doing this, but I guess not. So we were sponsoring this one if it goes. So Shopsy can't bring an article forward, um, but the board's never really talked about this. I mean, I've heard bits and pieces that, that Jay Tallerman had said one thing to Shopsy at a Shopsy meeting, but I, I, again, I don't know the full gist of what exactly they're looking to do. I guess there's some confusion on language because some towns don't require um, CPC approval, you know, once town meeting signs off on the uh, transfer into the buckets, that's it. It should automatically go into the trust fund. Um, I think there's some contention on this one with CPC. I think it's it's a much bigger discussion, Kathy. Um, I'm certainly Andrew's on Shopsy now. Uh, they've, they've talked about pretty extensively, Andrew, if you wanna follow up with Dorian even. Um, I've only, again, I haven't had a lengthy discussion about this. I just know that Jay Tallerman had gone to the meeting and told them some things. And I don't know that CPC necessarily agrees with it. So, Jay Talon told them that it was very unusual to do what we have done yeah. here in his experience. So, yeah, I, as far as what we're doing now, going to the CPC bucket yes. first. Uh, CPC having approval for well, that bucket after, after town yeah. meeting vote. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, is it in the language of the current article that we need to look at differently, or is it is this an so, ongoing? I, I think, I think and, and Lisa, you stop me when I get it wrong um, or just stop me in general if I'm going too far. But um, I think that the three articles that have been approved previously mm -hmm. do require the um, Shopsy or the trust to have to go to CPC with a proposed project or mm -hmm. something and, and have CPC agree to release the money. Now that language um you know council will say that that's probably not how it's done but that's how it was voted so yeah. town yeah. meeting did so this is, this is this is perspective yeah. not retroactive if you wanted to do anything with those prior three votes you need to put those back on and go yeah. back and redo those but I, really I think it's sorry kathy i think it's too that jay saying the language as they go forward at town meeting is more restrictive than other towns do. Right. Other towns just put the money into the affordable housing trust every year instead of Shopsy. And I, I'm sorry, instead of the CPC. So I, I think this is a broader discussion, Kathy. I mean, I think CPC is going to have some very strong feelings on this. And before we have it out on town meeting floor, I would well, suggest. Let me just say this. I'm sitting here saying, I don't get this. So I don't either. He's not going to get it either if I don't, you know. So um, this is not something you want to try to hash out. No. no, no, nope. right? Um, I agree. I don't, know, I don't know whether or not um, whether or not this is something you try and address globally in an article that is not a CPC project, and how bind you know and how binding that is because CPC again votes to bring projects forward with certain conditions and everything to town meeting. So is this best addressed in a CPC you know a CPC project for shops you know for um, housing money? I'm, I'm not sure what the correct path is for this. I don't know that CPC is going to support this anyway, because, I mean, how many projects, let's be realistic, how many projects has the trust done? We bought back Stockwell, um, you know, so. That's it. Yeah, since I've been on the board, Kathy, we, we took so the right of first refusal. The only advantage of doing this is it's, it could speed things up. That's truly yeah. it. Because yeah. it yeah. property, the property becomes available. 
Yep. Uh, you might have money available to move. Yep, you can act. Yeah. I keep meaning to look. How much is in the affordable housing trust fund right now? 700 or so? Um, we just transferred 196. I think we were right around three. So maybe close to five, Kathy. I could be wrong, but I thought that's where we were at after Stockwell. All right. Clear. You don't have to go back to town meeting to transfer it. You have to have CPC vote to transfer it. Yeah, you, right. The article has already approved the money. Okay. Yeah. So you're not waiting for a town meeting. You're waiting for a CPC to. I thought and, there was a delay in there, but I'm not sure if you So again, I think it's a broader discussion. I don't know that it's ready for town meeting. Right. Um, okay, the next one. I originally had a slight issue with this. I don't anymore. So this is our um, deductible. You know, we basically have a warrant article that we put money in to pay for any deductible that we have on any claims we have for our uh, property insurance policy. So um, when we go to tell me, depending on what tell me is, we don't always know what our insurance is going to be for the next year. It depends on the timing of the meeting. Um, but if we did know it, um, and we've got that in the uh, um, budget for benefits, which is where it goes, um, you don't really have any wriggle room if you've got a bunch of deductibles you have to pay. And apparently we've had a kind of a rash of deductibles that we paid first part of this year, which is why this is, I don't care about this one anymore. So this is fine. So they're just going to put more money, you know, if we need it, we spend it. If we don't, it stays there. Yeah. And that's, I don't think there's any. Thing to get too excited about this one. Mm -hmm. Chelsea, you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice <laughs> Check it out. Um, okay, next one is bylaw. Okay, do we know who's going to do this one? I had spoken with Mr. Hegarty today and he is still taking a look at this. Um, we'll, not sure whether he's going to have something um, something for this or not, but if he does, he'll have it very shortly. Okay, so he pulled this one. You know, he had this. Um, yeah. um, the, the warrant for later timing. So yeah. uh, this is really kind of up to him, but it's going to go for He's sponsoring it, so we'll have to see. I'm not a fan of this one particularly. I mean, the concept is fine, but I think it's <coughs> sufficiently flexible. Personal opinion, so. Well, we'll see you will have a chance to yes. receive that. Okay. All right, the next two are related. These are both from um, um, Possibility. Um, he wants money to do um, two things, and he's going to fund it by pulling more money out of the overlay reserve. Um, He's going to pull exactly the amount of overlay. So my question, how much I have to ask, which will is, we can pull a bit more out um, to help us with the other stuff. But anyway, um, so this will not affect the um, the tax levy because he's going to offset the um, cost with um, um, revenue he's putting on that. So the net effect to the tax bills will be zero. Um, so, okay. okay. So again, it's not a very exciting one. Sure. Okay. I have to send out the constables to round up the grid. Right. So that's yeah. actually a question that I had. So I'll uh, articulate some of these articles at the end. Hypothetical situation. If they walk out the after door, the tree by law, then it's the lock the door. 100 percent and 100 people. Nobody are there out. any of these articles that are going to have a serious effect if they're not? Act on by the consent agenda. Yeah. But I think I it's right. Yeah. We just lock the door. <laughs> I think I, I think I think Mr. Stivers is actually you know got um, you know because of the discussions with planning at the mm -hmm. annual meeting. So the really the two big articles or the big three articles are up front. Right. Yes. Right. Right. And then after that, it's pretty administrative. Um, and so I think that, you know, this board, after you close the warrant and get everything, so now you understand the universe, really need to engage the moderator in discussions okay. offline as to, you know, consent list. <laughs> consent the rest of You know, and, and so that maybe you've got out of this, you know, say, you've, you know, what we've got, 16. Um, well, we got now, rid of CPs. Now, so now 15. 15. Get rid know, of right? the so, shops so and maybe 14. You've got five or six articles that really need to talk about. Right. And the rest of them, you know. I mean, I, I also think after listening to advisory's debrief of last annual town meeting and special town meeting and seeing a lot of the social media discussion um, amongst uh, people with younger kids that, you know, both can't go to a meeting. I think we try to advertise this meeting as like, this is a good one for you to try to come to because we'll be able to 
you know, have some nice discussions about some of the things and clickers and, um, but it's not going to be a marathon event. So maybe, maybe we'll attract some. One night. Right. If you know, it's going to be one night. And, and it's like a trottier. And so it's a it's trottier. So, so maybe be. people will be, you know, want to try it out that haven't tried it before. And maybe we try to, you know, advertise special town meeting that way as, you know, come see how it is. I, I don't know. I, I know that, that was some of the feedback that I got is it's too long. And um, I think we're taking care of some things that we then don't have to have on the annual town meeting. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to be optimistic. <laughs> trying to get more people there. Yeah, we, we have to be so. I, I think. There's a separate issue in terms of, you know, other things we could do to promote interest uh, in addition to the usual Yeah. <laughs> right. But just to be honest, there's just not a lot here that is going to um, pick anybody's interest besides maybe the trees. Trace. And Chelsea, would you like to ask them if they would move it down? <laughs> no. <Nope. Okay. laughs> I don't want to ask so them that. I promise them that <laughs> we would keep it at the beginning. No, I think the, the suggestion of the consent article is on yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this moderator has been pretty aggressive. With his consent list, and I think has done rather well. If you go back and take a look at the track record over the last several meetings, yeah. Um, so I think that you know, as long as the articles in, in question, you know, are not controversial, and everyone seems to pretty much be in agreement with them, I think he's willing to to put them on there. You mm -hmm. know, and if the sponsor assents to it, to put them on there and try it. What the worst thing can happen is someone says they want to talk about them, they take them off. I don't see a lot that can, you know, and that's not my decision, but it looks to me like there are a lot of here that really could go on consent. Um, I think you got, we better try to keep Article 12 out of here. Um, so I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe a pitch of town meeting for you know, public spirit, et cetera. We need to get this done administratively, so don't desert the ship here. It's going to be brief. Right. But let's try to get it done. Mm -hmm. I think that would resonate with a number of people. Hopefully, other people. Right. And I think if you if you're looking to try to set the table as to what a special town meeting will look like and what we expect it to be, mm -hmm. people should understand this is going to when we're going to handle a lot of those non financial articles. So right. it's not sexy and exciting with dollars, mm -hmm. but but there are things that are important to how we do and what we do. Maybe publicize that concept fairly aggressively. Before. It's going to be quick because it's not a you know four hour plus meeting at all. Um, so that will help a lot. Now somewhere. it is, but well, I'm just talking about you know if somebody knew it's two hours versus four, uh -huh. that makes a big difference from people trying to get kids in bed, whatever, um, trying to get to work in the morning. So, um, right. All right. Okay, so we've been through them. So everybody's happy for where we stand at this point. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Having a jerk, yes, we're very happy. Yes, we had a hand up earlier, but that's gone. Um, we had we had a hand up during yeah. the um, yeah. interviews. I'm um, Kevin. I'm somebody. So I, didn't, I don't know who it was. He was so anyway. Maybe it was up accidentally. Okay, I think that's it. Everybody agreed. Oh, yes. Public comment. Okay, so any public comment? Mason, Kevin, and Marcy. No hands up. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Roll call vote. Lisa. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Sam. Aye. Chelsea. Aye. Cook aside. Five zero. All right. We're at nine twenty six p.m. Okay. Okay. So again, I, I hope no one's found you about tomorrow night. Um, but we get some.